Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Scientists studying neutron stars now have a nicer view of the surface of a neutron star. Nicer isn't an adjective that I normally use, but in this case it's appropriate because this is talking about the nicer telescope, the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. This is a small telescope on the International Space Station. Now, it doesn't produce images. What it does is it collects the photons and it records the exact time and energy of them. And using this, it's actually been possible for scientists to deconvolve the data and detect surface features on an object which is maybe 20 kilometers across while it is 325 parsecs away. That is a really, really, really small object. In terms of angular resolution, uh, it corresponds to something like 0.1 nano arc seconds across at that distance, which you know, compare that to the Hubble Space Telescope where the finest details that can be resolved are 0.05 arc seconds. So this is 500 million times smaller than anything the, the Hubble Space Telescope can resolve. But to resolve this data requires some smart use of uh, the information that NICER provides. So as you probably know, pulsars are known as pulsars because they produce pulses of radio waves at regular intervals, extremely regular. In the case of the pulsar that they were investigating, it was called PSR J0030 plus 0451. It's uh, about 325 parsecs away and it rotates 200 times per second. And while those radio waves are the things that let us know that pulsars are pulsars, this telescope is looking in the x-rays because the x-rays come from the surface of the pulsar, whereas the radio waves tend to come from the magnetosphere around it. So by taking the photons that were observed over a couple of weeks and knowing the rotation, you can essentially resort your time so that you produce a, an x-ray spectrum that corresponds to the rotation of the object. You're folding all your time back into one single rotation, showing that as the star rotates, it presents a different X-ray spectrum. And the main thing that drives these changes as the star rotates is the surface of the neutron star is not perfectly uniform. There are hot spots. In particular, there are hot spots where the magnetic field dives inside the neutron star. And that there, it's easier for energetic particles to follow the magnetic field lines and collide with the surface to create hot spots. So now the challenge is to take this periodic spectrum and figure out what pattern of hotspots on the surface of the neutron star can make it. And they do this using something called relativistic ray tracing. So if you're a gamer, you know about ray, ray tracing. What you do is for every pixel on the screen, you trace the light rays back through you know, fog, through mirrors, glass, transparency, whatever that's necessary to make your new video game look absolutely amazing. It's slow, but modern GPUs are, are really including this in some of the latest games. Relativistic ray tracing is similar in concept, except that the light rays can get bent. Neutron stars are really close to being black holes, so the gravitational effects are significant. In fact, neutron stars are special because you can actually see light from the surface on the far side of the object because the light rays will get bent around it. In fact, they're the, probably the only object where you can see more than 50% of their surface due to this bending of light. If you were close enough to resolve a neutron star, the neutron star would actually appear wider than its actual diameter because of this bending. Of course, you probably wouldn't notice because you would be very dead very quickly because of the amount of energetic radiation coming from pulsars. Another thing that relativistic ray tracers have to take account of is the frame dragging effect. Because the pulsar is spinning so fast and is so compact, it actually drags space time around with it and light rays will get pulled into a kind of orbit and get twisted around before they reach the surface or rather as they leave the surface, they will get twisted on the way out towards the observer.
And another important relativistic effect is the Doppler shifting of the light or the X-rays as the surface moves around the star as a hotspot comes towards the observer that will change the frequency distribution and similarly as it goes away it will change that. And also because the photons are climbing out of this deep gravity well that will redshift them as they travel out towards the observer. So the ray tracer can model the trajectories of the photons as they leave the surface, as they travel through the hydrogen atmosphere and ultimately make their way towards the observer. So we should know the colors and distributions of the photons as they arrive at the observer. So the trick is to start with a model of the neutron star and try to recreate the X-ray spectrum that we see with NICER. So they started with a model that had two hotspots corresponding to two magnetic poles because the hotspots are where the poles come into the surface. Uh, they simulated this system, they looked at the profile it produced, and then they would move the hotspots around, they would change different parameters such as the radius, the surface temperature, until they began to you know, converge on something that matched what they had seen. The paper I was looking at said that this took something like 500,000 core hours on a supercomputer. So that's a fair amount of processor power, I would say. And converging a model towards something that matches the expected outcome is as much an art as it is a science, but they did eventually come up with a viable result. Uh, interestingly, in this case, the magnetic poles aren't on opposite sides of the star. In fact, they're both in the same hemisphere, the hemisphere which is furthest away from Earth. So here's the thing. This wasn't the only team to do this. I've perhaps unfairly been focused on one team that did it. Two teams basically did this in parallel on their own because the nicer data is made available very quickly to many, many people. So you might ask, do these teams come up with the same results? Well, the second team that did it, they also found a solution which had two hotspots in the hemisphere furthest from Earth. But they also actually tried an alternate model where they had three hotspots and they found another solution that seems valid with a hotspot very near to the pole that's, again, furthest from the Earth. So this highlights a very specific problem that exists with this kind of approach. You can build a model that reproduces the observations very accurately, but you can't be sure that your model is the actual correct model. You can certainly throw out a whole lot of bad models and show that they are garbage and that they will never work, but you have no guarantee that just because you found one thing that works that you're not going to find something else that works and you might have an infinite number of possible solutions that make sense and that work. So while we're pretty confident that there's a couple of hot spots on this in these approximate locations, it's entirely possible that we're wrong. It's entirely possible that some of the spectral and frequency changes come via completely different mechanisms that we haven't accommodated in any of these models at this point. But this is a pretty amazing result. Neutron stars are some of the smallest objects in the universe, and this one is 325 parsecs away. It's a really, really ridiculous in, uh, distance. And yet, using this information, we have surprisingly strong confidence that there are surface features. We know where they are, roughly. We know how hot they are, and we also can derive parameters for the size of the neutron star, the mass, and other information. Astronomers have been measuring the radius, temperature, and mass of neutron stars for decades. And that is nice. But being able to get surface details, that is a whole lot nicer. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.